What is up, down and sideways, all you beautiful individuals? Welcome back. It is another rep of League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you. Day two action from the play in stage. BDS, you know, riding off that one day off after embarrassing the Golden Guardians back on the riff for Group B action. Should be routine, easy business. It's just the two seed from the VCS in Team Wales. And let me tell you, starting things off, we were riding the Garen momentum from Golden Guardians because the pocket pick gets through. Adam on the Darius in maybe the most one-sided top lane matchup that we've seen in all of 2023, courtesy yes to Sheo, camping the living hell out of Oh my goodness, if the Golden Guardians performance, if the the way that Adam dismantled that whole squad was, you know, a red fire alarm going off, this was one of those nuclear yellow ones where you're like, this is really a problem going on here. He laid down a beatdown game one on the signature Darius that we all know and love him to play. And instantly it's that warning to everybody else at Worlds. You don't let this one through against Adam. And I think that there's a conversation, of course, about everything else that's going to come. But yes, you better believe that the Adam show, full effect for BDS, pedal to the metal, game one in the books, BDS one up. There were multiple moments that if you translate this game to solo queue, you see your opposing top lane Darius in a three in a 2v3 scenario he comes away with a triple kill what's happening to your team Mark everyone's muted there's pigs everywhere and the game's over doesn't matter what time of the game it is it's a slash ff15 right there you buddy that is the only way you're escaping from that Darius hell and the only way to escape it was that nexus getting taken down BDS taking that early advantage in the series and look the other parts of BDS all function very well, all look pretty good in this one as well. But the main power point, that one that led them to this exp uh, you know, explosion on the rift is that play from Adam in the top side. You don't have to do much when your Darius can face check a bush into five people, live to tell the tale, and you end up getting an ace. That was kind of the final nail in the coffin here. Adam was laughing the whole time, and again, rightfully so, because he absolutely smashed that top lane matchup. But this is the first moment of Worlds 2023 where we say, God bless having a best of three and not a best of one scenario because we roll into that second game and Team Wales says, hmm, what was the problem in that first game? I'm going to go ahead and take that Bear Darius out of the rift, gets it banned, which means Adam is put on the Renekton into that second game and we get a different completely broken 80 carry or champion to highlight. It's the Kaisa in game two for Artemis. Much closer second game, but Team Wales bounces back in a huge way. I think I've been just traumatized by Zeri and the Ophelioses that we have seen so much that you forget what Kaisa can do when you're in one of these professional hands and you really take it to the max, you're really popping off and you've got those damage numbers, you've got those values just in that sweet spot where you're able to accelerate and get to this power level. That's what we saw Artemis really able to do in this second game. As you mentioned, the Darius, get it out of here. We don't want to see that again from the Team Wales perspective. And one of the things that we always talk about, and it's great to see in a best of three type of situation, it's even more important, I think, in a best of five, you get checkmated, you get beat down by someone else and you identify that as the problem. That was something that was different, changed the course of how we were playing or how everything played out and you take it away. Beat me with something else. Show me that you've also got it. And right there, game two, BDS, Adam. Yes, he was okay. Managed to get a little bit of an advantage on that Renekton, but the later impact, the way that he was able to translate that to the rest of the BDS team, not the same as we have seen with this Garen, with that Darius. It was not able to operate. You were able to get those, these advantages and even looking on the side of Team Wales. Shout out to Mr. Sparta in the top side. What he was doing on that Kazante pit. Listen, it's hard to bounce back from a game where you get that smashed in the top lane. And even though, again, it took a little while for things to get rolling for him, he did still have impact. Hard not to when you're on Mr. Kazante. And listen, BDS played the first 25 minutes of this game pretty cleanly. We had some really good objective control from Nuke on the Talia walls throughout. And then it's really just one big team fight where Bean Jay 
the the Levi that we were promised at this event is able to pop off on the Viego to get an ace and eventual Baron over two team wheels. And I love BJ popping off, my man, because we've seen him a couple times here or there, different international events, and we have seen the potential that is there. And of course, always compared to Levi, this you know star standout player that we have seen from the VCS, and absolutely. Haven't really seen those Levi-esque performances out of Levi himself. Getting it from your boy, Bean J here for Team Wales. Really thought that was great. This is game two, where you do get that punch back from your boys on Team Wales. How do you respond? Game three, how do you turn it around? Is that question, what is that mental for BDS? We're about to get those answers. Yeah, when you have a double kill, double digit kill Kaisa, you say, okay, we don't want to deal with that. And that is... Absolutely. What happened in that third game? It's the Zaya for Artemis. Problem is, it doesn't matter. When him and Bai in the bot lane are predicting arcane shifts out of Crowny with the Nautilus hook and then predicting the feathers after some absolutely immaculate 2v2 of the Team Wales bot lane. You get hit by one or two. You get hit by that second Nautilus hook type of situation. It's almost a wrap at that point, running that bottom lane at the way BDS As worried. Ezreal, who can animation cancel ever getting hit by a hook? It's it's this tough one, right? Because you do have that extra, you know, safety. And I think that that's also one of those things is that you think in your mind, hey, I've got this jump, I've got this shift. I'll, I'll get it right. I'll make sure that I'm not getting hooked. And then you get hooked and you're in trouble. That was the situation Crowny finding himself in. And of course, uh, you know, there's never a good time really to see Crowny's Comet wish right by you. But uh, this was certainly not the series where you wanted to see Crowny's Comet wishing right by you on the Ezreal level. Yeah, definitely. You know, Ezreal's a pick historically you always talk about having, you can be fast, passive, fall into not having huge impacts in games. And the problem was, Artemis in games two and three. The guy was 16, zero, and 13 across the board. Absolute uh, masterclass performance. And listen, the 80 carry pool at this event, we've already highlighted at the main stage, these world-class guys that are there. But look at play-ins. You had Waco and Route in day one, and then you had Artemis in games two and three here. The ADC level right now with these playmaking champions like Kaisa and Zaya is, man, it's through the roof. It's fantastic. And I think it's, again, one of these things that we, you know, covering the scene and, and keeping track of things for a while. This has been building up the way that the play in teams, minor regions are leveling themselves, are carrying these little threats here or there. You got to be taking them seriously. This is an example of what they were able to do in this series. See that damage coming across. You're looking at Artemis and what he was doing on that Zaya, what he was able to do before on that Kaisa. You think traditional sports, it's so easy to see a guy step up and deliver a performance, you know, rise up to the occasion, say, I'm that type of guy, I got my team. That's the type of stuff I think we were seeing out of Artemis today. And sure, it's not that overly impressive physical presence that you get with traditional sports, but I think the mechanical finesse that we saw on these champions, that execution that we saw and the confidence out of him Really great signs for Team Wales. And I know, obviously, disappointing if you're a Western fan, EU fan, to see BDS fall to losers. But boy, for the VCS who were catching so much flack after that first day performance from the Gigabyte Marines, you absolutely love to see Team Wales show up in such a big way because, I mean, listen, this series goes more the way of Team Wales playing well than BDS underperforming. Yeah, this was absolutely more about really getting that check, really seeing out their eyeball test on an international stage on the rift that Team Wales is for real and really a bounce back for the VCS region as a whole because of the way things have been kind of soured or, or lessened down by not getting the performances that we know and should be characteristically getting from the Gigabyte Marines. Here it is from Team Wales showing that level of power, showing that skill that is required to be a team that is picking up wins at Worlds. Put one of them in the Team Wales column. And I think if you're on that Western side, on that Team BDS angle that you're looking for, yes, not great, but here's the silver lining. Here is the positive positive copium hopium overdose for you guys right now. Is that, yes, you got punched in the mouth. You got taken down. But like any good young hotshot fighter that you're looking at, how do you respond 
when you take that hit? That is the question for me when you're looking at BDS. What type of resolve do they got? What type of rebound? You know, you got Adam laughing in game one, and now you get humbled a little bit. You get knocked down. What's that response? Are you angry and you get out there and you put that fire on the rift? Or are you going to take it back and, and sink in to that level? And that's not what you want to be seeing from BDS. And listen... Europe as a region has a pretty good history of backs against the wall, tiebreaker scenarios, must win, do or die scenarios coming out on top. So BDS going to have that loser's run to still get through. And now we know who their opponent is going to be. We actually knew before this matchup, you had the Flying Oysters matching up against DFM, both squads making their season debut. And after we were gushing over what we saw out of PSG in that first matchup, remember... Flying Oysters took them to game five, were competitive against them, all split long over in the PCS. And this is an example of why a lot of it was Jimmy in on the Jason. This game, my guy's picking up Quadra kills. He's getting some disgusting amounts of damage. But we got to highlight the center pick. Utapon's back at 80 carry because they got a guy who hasn't played professionally in two years in the top lane for DFM. But Senna? Okay, flat out right away off the gate. Wonky stuff going on with DFM. And we got to kind of push it aside and just examine what you got here. What type of play we saw on the Rift from the, both these squads. And yes, the Oysters come out here. And this is one of those things where you saw PSG the day before. We knew that, you know what? The Oysters aren't that far off from that level of play that you are seeing from PSG. And I think a lot of people are gonna underestimate them either with a funny name or because you don't know enough about the PCS or paying attention to notice and acknowledge the level of power that region has been building up. And the Oysters really show it today because where's this guy been hiding? Where's Jimin been hiding, my man? Dealing out the damage, dishing it out on that chase. There's a moment where I think Ice has got like 70, 75 health, something like that. One. One Empowered Shockwave Blast sending you to the gray screen. See you later in the fountain. Yeah, the lethality damage plus Infernal Soul plus an incredibly underleveled Senna made for an absolutely ludicrous uh, amount of damage. And then, you know, in that second game, we get a more traditional 80 carry for Utapon. He plays the Zaya. It's not the Senna, thank goodness. But the biggest issue in this series uh, for DFM, it wasn't a 31-year-old, oldest player in the history of an international event who hasn't played in two years, playing Aatrox in back-to-back -back games. It wasn't the issue. It was Steel running in and dying over and over again, who's been one of the key cogs for DFM's success over the last few years. He had a real bad series. Uh, and I don't know what his teammates are, are feeling and going through right now, but I can tell you, pretty similar probably to the solo queue experience where you're pinging the guy and you know... Don't be going here. There's going to be something happening. If you want to engage up there, no one's there to support you. All these type of things. The ADC's down in the bottom lane, whatever. Don't be going there. Your homie goes there and he gets taken out. That's the way it played out. Steel. It was really unfortunate to see because I think obviously he's someone that has been an integral part of DFM leveling up, of being someone that is involved in, in what goes right for this team and sets the pace. Today really was not it for him in both of these games in this series, really running into trouble and really running his team into that deficit. What was a treat to watch in that second game, flashbacks to shout out to E-Star in the LPL, Shao C. What a Blitzcrank performance in that second game. He was all over the map grabbing hooks. He's even pulling a Kali out mid dash to save his AD carry. He was 100% the MVP in that second game for the Oysters. I love it. And it's one of these tests that will always come through when someone says, OK, I don't think you're that good. Right. The question we saw it in game one that, you know, respect ban towards that Blitzcrank. And then they said, OK, yeah, we, we got beat. But still, I, I we, we think that you're not really showing us anything that special with it. The Blitzcrank steps in. Yes, you're hitting those hooks. And not only were you hitting quite a lot of them. You're hitting the big ones, the juiciest ones, the ones that mattered the most. That's the difference maker for me on this one. And yes, I'll see. Really happy to see him pop off on that pick. You know your Blitzcrank is feeling it when he's Hextech flashing over the wall <laughs> and blind shooting hooks over the other wall. Just to, you know, why not? Why not see if I can catch a fish here? Hey, you got that mojo rolling. You thinking that you can hit <laughs> anything out there is looking as big as the sky. Love it from your boy taking his chances. And 
look, if you're in the position, the way that you were playing for the Oysters, absolutely take those chances, take those opportunities to keep that pedal on the metal, keep that acceleration going in that game. Really think that this was a wonderful performance by these Oysters and, you know, not to overdo it and get too crazy about it, but this is that reinforcement on what we saw yesterday from PSG, now today with the Oysters, about how much we are viewing the PCS and the level of the elite teams that get through and the type of damage that they're going to be able to do at the international events. And listen, we understand that probably now this version of DFM and then you had uh, Rainbow 7 for PSG, probably the two weakest teams in this play-in stage that the PCS has matched up against so far. But, I mean, they got the business done against these teams, and I think they're absolutely going to show, even against some of the better teams at this event, that they are here for a fighting chance. And now, when you look at that winner's side, you got a pair of two seeds from their region uh, in Team Wales and the Flying Oysters matching up on one side. Oh, baby. And now you're also throwing in on the other side, of course. You got your boys PSG and you're throwing in the loud crew from Brazil. This is going to be fantastic stuff. And I think one of the best things about looking ahead, looking at those winners matchups that we are going to have is, is a little bit of a level up. Because I think in the games that we have seen so far, yes, exciting to get live games out there. Yes, we have seen some high quality performances and standout type of things. But I think the overall quality, the back and forth, that I think a lot of people are looking for, something extremely competitive and close. We're going to start turning up that dial when you get these matchups. PSG loud. You're looking at what you got there and what we saw today from Wales and from the Oysters. <clears throat> now, loud is always one of the most exciting ones because of you know the personalities on the team and the fan base behind them. But the way the formatting's working here is the winners of these winner finals are going to lock up that first seed from their respective groups and the qualification matches eventually are you know seed one from a versus seed two from b and vice versa on the other side so obviously huge stakes as every game will be going forward but yeah psg versus loud that is a marquee matchup and now has incredibly high stakes because you look at how things are playing out you're potentially now looking at BDS on the loser side matching up against PSG in that qualification match. And of all the teams in this playing stage, if you're BDS, that's the one you're sweating the most. That is the big dog hanging around in this little pond for the play-in stage. It's going to be incredible. I can't wait, man, because this is what we have been asking for so many times. And this is just the little appetizer, the little sample of some of the changes that have gone through and that we're going to get into this situation. And as you lined up, when you're looking at a team like BDS, now in the situation that they're going to be in, you've entered that territory where that is a possibility and almost, frankly, a guarantee if you get through that that is what you're facing up against in that one. And look, we talked about BDS and we felt great about them after the Golden Guardians. I still feel really good about this team with even with that question mark hanging over them after this loss to Team Wales of whether they can get back up, how they're going to respond to taking that punch here and going down a game. This is what we're going to be seeing and I'm feeling good about them. You don't feel all that good, though, when you see PSG, when you see Maple on the other side of that rift, that pedigree, that experience that comes across against a BDS squad that is only building this type of experience at this point. Absolutely something to be concerned about. And the truth is, even if PSG loses to Loud, well, that means Loud is legit a team to be terrified of. So either way, now you've, you've kind of shot yourself in the foot coming in as, at best, that two seed. Uh, for BDS and yes they're going to match up against DFM to kick things off on that loser side and yes Adam versus Appaman might be a uh, slightly terrifying matchup to see if you are a fan of uh, DFM <laughs> yeah I think it's going to be quite a bloody fun no matter what happens what picks are coming through I'm expecting that one to be that type of way even with kind of this you know negative outlook on, on the type of thing about possibly matching up against a PSG and yes maybe not feeling wonderful about the performance against Wales I still really think there is a positive way to look at BDS and still realize that they have this opportunity to have that bounce back how do you figure things out how do you tighten the screws on Adam just a little bit find it to get opt back into that optimal performance window where he is being that antagonistic threat to the enemy team, but still providing that value, feeding it back in, powering up the other parts of this BDS team. 
that is one of those things that I'm I mean really hopeful to see still in this play and stage. Yeah, they still have the opportunity to level up against DFM and then whoever they play on that other side before they're matching up against the squad like Loud or PSG. Because the reality is for anyone in this playing stage to advance, it's three best of threes you're going to have to be uh, winning to get through. And now the other side, you talk about GAM versus R7 on that loser side. We have the potential for a Civil War matchup where Team Wales if they can get that first seed over the Flying Oysters, could be matching up against Gam on that other side of the bracket. And problem there is then Gam just says, oh, we're back in the BCS. Great. So we'll probably stomp them and then flop at the main stage. Oh, Wales, what a price to pay to finally (laughs) unlock the true power of the Marines in the international stage. That'd be a heck of a thing. Because again, there is that familiarity with these two teams, with these two squads. You can look back and how they play throughout the VCS. But you're right, a lot of the times, it did look like there just is this mental uh, aura around a team like the Marines back in their own region. And now we're on the international stage. Now things are different. Now... Levi is struggling. Now we see Bean J popping off for Team Wales. Absolutely could be that changing of the guard. What better way to do it than with that head-to-head showdown? And, you know, if that ends up being true, then Gam is going to have to show up against either Loud or PSG, whoever the loser is there. And if they get enough momentum to take down either Loud in a rematch or a star-studded looking PSG, then yeah. Team Wales or Flying Horse, they're probably sweating. So there's still potential, definitely, for some of these two seeds, uh, you know, BDS, the obvious one, or even GAM to kind of upset, upset who these top seeds are going to be heading into the qualifying matches. Ooh, and that's what it's all about, isn't it? That's where these play-ins get juicy. That's where these games start to heat up. That's where the strategy really comes under that spotlight when you're looking at this best of three, how it's a little bit different than a best of five, how you got to hit that, you know, gas pedal a little bit earlier, all these type of things, that momentum shift. This is where we're all going to be learning about it and experiencing it and enjoying the thrills and dramatics of Worlds. Still just warming up so far at Worlds. But yeah, PSG Loud, definitely the headliner in tomorrow's games. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. Thanks for watching as always, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.